New Hollywood was an interesting time for film. It was a rebellion against the old Hollywood, the good guys always win, the bad guys always lose type of movies. It was a rebellion against the factory style making movies where everything was shot in studio and on lot. And it was a rebellion against the censorship from the Hayes Code, which prevented even showing two married couples from sleeping in the same bed. New Hollywood wasn't very pristine. It was gritty, they shot on the streets, on location, and believed a little too much in method acting. Like with Dustin Hoffman staying up for three days in Marathon Man to portray a character who's stayed up for three days. But they added a new realistic documentary-like authenticity that dared many to call the 70s the best decade for film. It was the emergence of such directors as William Friedkin, Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, Brian De Palma, John Cassavetes, and many more. But chances are you already know about these directors, or at least have heard of them. But there's one director from New Hollywood that I feel is especially underappreciated, and that is Peter Yates. Now some of you may know him and his work quite well, and that's great for you. But in the modern day of 2024, I'd say he's quite under the radar. Especially for his filmography, which had a profound effect in its day, and influenced the likes of directors such as Tarantino. Peter Bogdanovich, and Clint Eastwood. His two most famous movies are Breaking Away, a nice little coming-of-age film set in Indiana, and is about a group of teenage boys, and one particularly who's obsessed with being Italian. And he's also made some less notable films, like Kroll, a Star Wars knockoff, and hit video game, The Dresser, about a Shakespeare company during World War II, and The Deep about people diving for treasure. However, his other most notable film is Bullet with Steve McQueen. But before we get there, let's talk about his preceding film, Robbery from 1967. Robbery made 1967 was a British heist movie based on the real life Great Train Robbery in 1963. It was considered the heist of the century at the time and the real life story lasted up until the 21st century. It was Yates' third film he directed, and the first crime film of his. He, as a younger man, was on a racing team, and ended up working under film director Tony Richardson, who was a big influence on Yates. The film follows a group of men as they plan and execute the robbery of a mail train. It starts off with a jewel heist in a great car chase sequence that's really the highlight of the film. But upon succeeding in that heist, which involves them dressing up as paramedics, and doing some tuck-in rolls. The leader, Paul Clifton, played by Stanley Baker of Zulu fame, encourages them to invest the score into a better heist of robbing a few million from a mail train. The film becomes a methodical heist crime procedural as Paul Clifton and his pals plan out the heist and recruit the people necessary. But with the inspector George Landon on his tail, even having one of his buddies, and some recruits having issues with how they get their cut, trouble arises. The film is a realistic heist slash crime procedural with everyone acting professional and doing their job as assigned. Things do go wrong but that is real life. There isn't heightened drama that happens just to happen and everything is about planning and executing the heist. There is still humor though. Some things are intentional like one of them jogging in jeans or a prison break date to suspend your disbelief to enjoy. I mean, how does no guard see that? But the humor is also intentional as well, like the prisoner being told by a corrupt guard that he's escaping from prison, whether he likes it or not. This line. He handled matters concerned with safety and care of bank vaults and safeguarding high value currency. The case officer added that he made no use of this knowledge but committed straightforward embezzlement. Or a police identification scene where There's even a character similar to Werner from Better Call Saul, who both really love their wives. The film feels very British, as you see not just with the criminals, but with locations, the police, and even money counters on the train. One of the starring actors is William Marlowe, presumably Philip's British nephew. It's shot on location, and captures it quite well, immersing you in London and the countryside. The film isn't super accurate to the heist, but that is to be expected with the movie. The only inaccuracy that really grinds my gears is the fact that in real life, when counting up the money in a hideout, the robbers played Monopoly with real money, but they didn't know such thing in the movie, which would have made a good scene rather than just playing chess. The film did well in Britain, but not in the US. But a notable American did see the film, and liked it. Especially the car chase. That man was Steve McQueen. <laughs> Upon seeing the car chase scene in Robbery, Steve McQueen, who was looking to produce his first film, decided upon Peter Yates to direct, and they decided to adapt from a novel called Mute Witness by Robert L. Fish. McQueen had to fight for Yates to direct a film as he was virtually unknown in the US, but got the okay. The film starred McQueen, 
and was shot in San Francisco. The film follows Steve McQueen as Lieutenant Bullet, who's in charge of a witness protection case that escalates. He is calm, stoic, and cool, as Steve McQueen naturally is. He likes doing things the right way and has an antagonistic relationship with an opportunistic senator, Walter Chalmers, who just cares about looking good rather than doing good, and played by Robert Bond, whose real-life political ambitions were supposedly destroyed because of this role. Bullet is different from other cotton movies in many ways. He is competent and professional. His relationship with his girlfriend, played by Jacqueline Bisset, is normal and healthy. They aren't constantly arguing, and his relationship with his captain is amicable and not antagonistic, unlike the cliché in many of these cop movies and shows. The characters also aren't too stupid either. Like, for instance, a doctor tells a strange man where he may find a gunshot victim, but upon realizing that may have been a bad idea, calls Bullet as a heads up. The film is a classic with one of the most famous car scenes in cinematic history. That's simply a masterpiece in not just editing, but sound design. And the stunts themselves, with Steve McQueen being a car fanatic who did all his own stunts. So it comes as a surprise to learn that they didn't even originally plan to have a car chase, but thankfully decided later on to do so. McQueen was dedicated to doing stunts himself, even at a scene in the airport field we see him die below an actual plane as it passes by him, showing just the lengths he would go. Peter Yates knew how to use the location very well, like for the car chase scene down the hills of San Francisco, and even just the hotel the witness stays at, where you can see a highway right outside, which most directors would avoid choosing a place like that. A for recording the sound, and B because it's a bit of an eyesore. B. Yates, being a Brit, saw the atmosphere that would bring, and he also thought of freeways as veins through the city. And it added atmosphere to what otherwise would have been a more generic view of the city. There's a lot of dedication to realism in this film, like with Peter Yates using real people instead of actors. For many roles, like some of the doctors at the hospital and the cop in the evidence room, which adds a level of authenticity, to even putting mistakes in the film, like when the doors to the ambulance aren't open, or when Steve McQueen has to back up when driving in the car chase. These flourishes add to the atmosphere of the film, and the loose, more fluid camera work add a documentary type of feel that doesn't feel too crude or gimmicky. Cops weren't too popular in the California area in the 1960s, so McQueen took a risk in being the king of cool playing the role, and was even a little apprehensive to play, but the cop was a more sympathetic, less purely rough stuff type of cop, who does what he thinks is right, dresses like a fashionable Englishman, and even does small things like stealing a newspaper, showing that it's human. The movie is one of the best police procedurals out there, so I strongly recommend, and so does Quentin Tarantino, who dedicated a blur of his book, Cinema Speculation, on it, so you know it's good. Now the next film on this list is The Hot Rock from 1972. It's a lot different from Bullet. It follows the criminals instead of the cops and it functions more as a comedy. It stars Robert Redford as a criminal mastermind Dortmunder who's frequently in and out of prison and his brother-in-law George Segal who's a bit of an enabler offering him a job the second he leaves prison. This movie is adapted from the book of the same name by Donald Westlake who created a whole series on Dortmunder and just like the movies is a heist comedy and was adapted by the William Goldman. The job for them is to steal a gem for the Brooklyn Museum for a Dr. Amusa, because the gem is in dispute at the UN between many African nations. It'll be better for his country to have it and not wait for the UN to blow it. The events that unfold after Dortmund agrees to do the job are wild and quite hilarious. They have to get a crew together, a car fanatic named Stan, who's kind of a protege to Toro, and a Greenberg, who's more of an explosives expert, but is also a weakened klutzy screw-up. I can't hold it. The heists in this movie are a perfect blend of comedy with suspense, notably the first heist from the museum, which goes wrong in the most hilarious way while also being quite suspenseful. And then, of course, after that heist, they have to go and spring someone from prison, and then they have to take a helicopter ride through Manhattan, where we even see footage of the Twin Towers under construction, and then they have to fake an insurrection at a police station. And the rest I won't spoil, but it gets pretty ridiculous in a good way. The Quincy Jones soundtrack also adds a nice light and suspenseful atmosphere at the same time. The film is ultimately about Robert Redford's character having terrible luck and bad breaks. He has been in and out of prison many times in the gym or the hot rock he's trying to get is continually out of reach, despite his masterful plans. He even has gastritis from all the frustration and has to take medicine or stomach junk. The film is a heist comedy film, which is different for many at the time which were downers and more pessimistic and was why Peter Yates wanted to do the project. 
The film is just purely entertaining to watch with interesting character dynamics like between Seagal and Redford and it's just the scale of the heist. Some things don't really make sense but it's entertaining and funny so it doesn't really matter. It's definitely worth watching if you can find it. Unfortunately it's not on VOD or streaming in the US or anywhere else that I know of and the Blu-ray costs $75 due to scarcity. So hopefully there can be a new release of this movie soon through Criterion or another boutique label like Kino Lorber. The final film is The Friends of Eddie Coyle, the most serious and realistic of the bunch. It's about a low-level mob associate named Eddie Coyle, or nicknamed Eddie Fingers. He's in a pickle as he was caught smuggling Canadian club up in New Hampshire and was found guilty. He has to go up for sentencing soon and is desperate not to serve any more time. He starts doing a business with a young gun dealer named Jackie Brown, who sells machine guns to other people, which is an enticing bit of information for Coyle. All while this is happening, there's a string of bank robbers going on, people who Coyle also know. As an in-between the robbers and Coyle, there's a bartender, Dylan, who is a part-time hitman and supposed friend of Coyle, who is also a friend of federal agent Foley who Eddie and Dylan both talk to, and when you first meet him, you're not sure if he's a buddy or a cop. The film takes place in a shot in Boston. We see suburbs and shopping plazas, grimy bars, the coastline, parking garages, and even the city hall of Boston, a building only an architect could really love. It covers all of Boston, and not just the picturesque shots of the city, and it stays on location. The extended shots of people walking, talking outside next to monuments, or even real footage of a Bruins game. The film really immerses itself in Boston, and is probably the best Boston Boston film out there, or at least that I've seen. The film is adapted from the book of the same name by George V. Higgins, who was an assistant U.S. attorney in Massachusetts, which is why the dialogue feels so authentic, as he was familiar with the criminals of the area and how they talked, and the book was a massive influence on such writers as Dennis Lehane and Elmore Leonard, who themselves have had their work adapted into film classics. Specifically, Tarantino adapted Leonard's novel Rum Punch into Jackie Brown, and the character in the book is called Jackie Burke. While the movie is Jackie Brown, and coincidentally, there's a character in this movie that is also called Jackie Brown. The film stars Robert Mitchum as Eddie, and he plays the role perfectly as someone who is just being enveloped and is trying to save his own skin. He isn't a genius criminal. He's quite at the bottom. He's a blue collar guy, like a garbage man or police officer, except he has a different job. He is in constant turmoil within himself, being a stand up guy and a permanent fink. He will do what he has to do to keep himself out of jail. Well, I got three kids and a wife at home there. I just can't do any more time. You know, the kids are growing up, they go to school, all the other kids laugh at them. Well, hell, I'm almost 51 years old. But he also doesn't want to ride on his friends, mostly because of fear of what will happen to him, but maybe also because of honor. He instead rats on someone not protected from the mob, Jackie Brown, who is played by Stephen Yeats. This is a guy who's smart and not at the same time. He can foresee a possible ambush, but he drives a car that's neon green and idiotically shows a guy he barely knows that he has machine guns in his car. Dylan the bartender is played by Peter Boyle, who you may know from other movies like Taxi Driver, Round Frankenstein, or most likely Everybody Loves Raymond. He kind of serves as the villain of the story, but not really as he's just watching his own back. The film is nothing glamorous, just gritty, rough and real. Even with some of the cast, like Alex Rocco, who is known for playing Mo Green in The Godfather, was an affiliate of the Winter Hill Gang, and even served time moving to California afterwards to escape his past and become an actor. He even acted as an in-between, helping Mitchum and Yates talk to real-life mobsters of the Winter Hill Gang, notoriously Howie Winter, Whitey Bulger's rival, which just added to the level of authenticity in the movie. Robert Mitchum even spent a lot of time talking to Boston police officers as well to help hone his Boston accent. It was the anti-Godfather, as Yates called it. Nothing glamorous, just gritty and rough and it's arguably Yates' best film. He did have some successes like The Deep or Breaking Away, which I recommend, but most of his other stuff afterwards had middling reviews or just box office bombs or both. So I urge you to watch these movies, and if you've already seen them, I urge you to watch them again. They're real treats with great rewatchability, and I think the name Peter Yates should be held up with other great directors of that era. 